So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our Combined Arms Center Commanding General, General Rainey. Sir, welcome to our annual meeting of the members, and uh, thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks to everybody out there for the invitation to speak to this very, very important group. Um, I, I know your schedule's tight, and uh, I, I always tell people, I think one of the kindest things you can do one human to another is share your time with them, and I, I try and be very respectful of that. I'm very appreciative of that. Um, so like like you mentioned, I'm, I'm Jim Rainey. I'm the commander of the Combined Arms Center. Most of you know Fort Leavenworth plus all the centers of excellence. Uh, Army University falls under me. Uh, more importantly, I'm the deputy commander of TRADOC for training and leader development. So I'm General Funks, the TRADOC commander. I'm his deputy for all things training and leader development. Um, I, I think I'm tracking, I got about 10 or 15 minutes and I wanna take whatever questions you have and I'll, I'll stay up you know, as long as until your guys cut me off uh, to answer questions because I, I really care uh, about this audience for a lot of reasons. But uh, so we do two things here. We build leaders and we drive change for the Army. And the drive change is about getting ready to fight great power competition, large scale combat ops. I mean, there, there's a lot going on. We can talk about that if you want. But way more important than that, as important as that is, is the build leader piece. And that, that's what I wanted to, to use my time with. I hope, I hope that's okay. Um, so the chief, I think talked to you yesterday and uh, at AUSA, the chief said, he's always said people first, but he established people as the number one priority of the army. So I think that's great guidance, not just because he's the chief, but because I think that's exactly the right thing to do. Our, our number one asymmetric advantage when you look at our peer and near peer competitors is our people, period. We got, we got a lot of great kid. It's important, um, but, but our asymmetric advantage is the United States military and the United States Army. We got better soldiers, we got way better leaders, and we got phenomenal commanders, men and women that can do things that nobody we're going to fight can do. Um, so I, I totally agree. So we're in the process right now, Joe Funk and me and all the people we work with, uh, the COEs and everywhere, is how do we operationalize people first? What does that mean? You know, what, what are we going to do with that with that guidance, that great guidance from the chief? Um, and and I, I said I think he's, he's spot on. I'll tell you why. I think the single number one most significant thing we can do for our men and women for our soldiers and their families is provide them a good leader so I've, I've, I've not been doing this as long as, as some of you but i've been doing it a while and i will tell you if you put good leaders in the unit then you don't have to worry about much else and the inverse of that is true you, you can't do enough for a platoon if it's poorly led um, so I, I believe the best thing we can do for our people is to provide them quality leaders across the board. Um, and, and before I go much further, yeah, I, to be clear, I'm talking to all four cohorts, right? Officers, NCOs, our great DA civilians, and our small but incredibly powerful warrant officer cohort, uh, you all. Um, it, it's all four cohorts and total army. Right, total army, all three compos. Um, I am a. I have. I have fought side by side with compo two and compo three. I. I. I, I worked for the 36th Infantry Division when I was brigade commander. When I was a battalion commander in Fallujah, I had reserve and National Guard <clears throat> soldiers on my task force in that in that great fight. Um, so I'm a believer. And I'll tell you more importantly, if, if you if you look at all potential conflict with Russia or China, uh, that, that is not a compo one problem. Okay? We're all in, that's everybody, total army. If you look at the history of our army, it is not won by the people that are on active duty when it starts. So I, I'm passionate about 
total army solutions to anything we come up with. Um, and, and thank you all for doing that. So I need your help. Uh, so if we talk about the warrant cohort across three compos, I think the best people to build the W1, W2 leaders we want are W4, W5 leaders that are doing what we want them to do the right way, right? Uh, so our senior warrant officers, to include those that are soldiers for life, just like officer cohort, NCO cohort, the power of some of the graybeard community, uh, especially when you look at, you know, we don't want to go backwards 20 years. We want to go forward, but we want to go back and, and rediscover some of the greatness of the army we had at, say, Desert Storm, uh, OIF-1, being able to do that, you know, again, not going backwards, but taking what we've learned in 20 years of conflict of reestablishing our maneuver, large-scale ground combat operation capability. So I need your help. A um, <clears throat> couple things, and I'll wrap it up. What we're working on very hard here right now. Number one, the profession. Okay, that 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 is the key. We we have to have leaders in our army who buy into and believe that this is a profession. I like to say uh, this, you know, it's not a job being in, being in the army. Um, we don't work at the army. We are the army. So buying into that ethic uh, that we're doing something bigger than ourselves and that we're going to have the character, competence, and commitment required to uphold that profession. So if we, we fail there, then we're through. You know, that's the end of the all-volunteer force. We're going to lose the trust and confidence of the American public. We're going to quit sending us our sons and daughters, and Congress is going to stop supporting us. So we have to, and I don't think it's broken, but we got to continue to emphasize the idea that we're all members of a profession. <clears throat> and people argue, and I'm open to having conversations about who's in the profession at what point in the career, uh, but indisputably, our great warrant officer population, in my view, are absolutely full card carry members of, of the profession, just like everybody else. Working hard on leader development. So we got to, <clears throat> most of us, some of us older folks benefited from an ethic of leader development. The, the, we're probably successful because we work for people that both were good at leader development and passionate about it. Um, candidly, I think we've lost a little bit of that. If you talk to people in the Army and say, you know, is leader development important to you? Like, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I like to say, if you ask anybody what makes a good leader, they always have an answer lead by example, confidence, selfless, they can go on and on. If you twist that a little bit and say, how do you make a great leader? How to make a great leader? People, candidly, some people struggle to answer that. And if they have an answer, they usually don't have a detailed plan. And if they have a plan, they usually haven't committed the resources required to make it a reality. So we're working real hard on how to, how to leader development. Uh, I think you're all probably aware uh, of a focus of the chief on assessments, really the chief and the sergeant major, and Steve Kilgore and I in the warrant cohort. So the chief's guidance is he wants to drive it, he wants to create a career long assessment, a culture of assessments across all four cohorts, all three compos in the army. And you're aware of BCAP and CCAP, but one, that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And that's the right place to start. Commanders will move into command sergeant majors. But, uh, but we got to start early. Wait until 16, 18 years in the Army to find out we got problems isn't the answer. So, so we'll, over the next year or so, we will, we will spread that career-long assessment into the warrant officer cohort. So we, we need help. I mean, what, what should we assess? When should we assess it? Where should we assess it? Warrant officer cohort. I'm talking to what, each level of PME, what do we want to assess? How is the best way to do that? And then what do we do with it? I don't want to use it to, to decide who goes where and who gets retained. I want to I want to empower self-development. I want warrant officers leaving PME with increased self-awareness and a plan to sustain their strengths and work on their on their uh, <clears throat> areas that they can improve. And I, I love all the warrants, but the, the aviation warrants and their ethic to a flight package. The way they, they 
keep records and PCS and check into the unit and sit down with the senior instructor pilots and the commanders and assess where they're at and what, what they're going to achieve during that tour. I, I would like everybody across cohorts and compost to kind of have that approach to uh, where they're at and what their current level of assessment is. So we're working hard on that and I'd, I'd love some help. And then the last one's PME. Um, a lot going on across the Army and all the cohorts and PME, and we, we have made no decisions about warrant officer PME. Um, but we got we got a we got a lot of ideas, and we would really <clears throat> we would really like to uh, take that next level. And and I again, no decisions have been made, but <clears throat> what what I'm you know I think there's this uh, uh, comp competence continuum, right? So I. I think, and it's not in doctrine yet, it will be because I get to write the leadership doctrine, but let's talk about competence, right? So I think that we start out, you know, the lowest level is you're knowledgeable about something, you know about it. Proficient comes next, means you can do it most of the time, followed by expert, expert level uh, on a skill. So if you're an expert, right, I know this resonates with warrant officers because this is what you're all about. If you're an expert, that means you can consistently do something in any level of adverse conditions, right? Pretty high bar. But beyond that, even there's mastery level, right? So when I think about the great senior warrants I've been around, they're the best example. Like I don't know many officers that I would consider mastery level of too many things. Uh, I think about our great NCOs that are just incredibly technically and tactically competent, but no kidding, mastery level. You know, our senior warrants are probably the best example of that level of competence anywhere in the Army <clears throat> for a lot of reasons. Um, so you, not only do I need your help figuring that out on the warrant cohort, but I think when we figure it out for the warrant, we're going to figure it out across the rest of our cohorts. Now, when I'm talking mastery, what's the difference between an expert and a master? To me, again, Rainey's definition, I think is mastery is the ability to create experts. So if you're so good at something, you can make somebody else an expert at it. That's a high bar, you know, one to 10% of, of human beings are, are so, and there's a lot of people, you all know them, that are experts but can't transfer that skill to anybody else. So I mean, that true, genuine mastery is, I think, a place where our senior warrants are probably going to figure that out, not just for their cohort, but for the whole whole, whole army. So I'm excited to talk about that. And I'll stop talking there so I can take some questions. But again, <clears throat> you know, a lot of you don't know me, some of you do. Talk's cheap. You know, invite me back next year and I'll tell you what we got done. But I'm talking every cohort of which the warrants are absolutely essential, mastery level technical and tactical expertise that's what i'm looking for uh and we got major efforts ongoing i think pme is a big part of that um, i i think the most the best people that have the most influence in that business are probably down at the coes the branches especially the, the senior warrants of each branch um, i think they're the ones who are best qualified to figure out what an aviation warrant should be able to do or a fire's warrant or an intel warrant a great sustainer. I think there's some point in the PME business where we should look at the, all the things we can bring to bear at Leavenworth, like we do with our officer cohort. You know, but uh, again, open the cards and letters on that. All four cohorts, and again, one more time for the total army out there. Um, you know, you know, large scale ground combat ops, right? It, it, it is a everybody, everybody's in. It's not a question of if you're going; it's how fast can you get there. And uh, I just appreciate everybody's service. So with that, sir, I'm, I'm available to try, given the limits of technology, to answer any questions you have for me. Over. Hey, sir, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we do have uh, a few questions that uh, have come in. Um, one of them is actually kind of an interesting one. Given the pandemic's impact on training, can you give some positive aspects of how rethinking the training project process has benefited the army? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So one, we're learning. Um, 
I can't remember who taught me this, but, but you know, I learned to never waste a crisis, right? So if something bad happens, it's a, you know, it sucks, but it's an opportunity to learn and shame on you if you don't learn from it. So we across TRADOC and, and my portfolio, uh, all the COEs and every school we're doing, we're learning a lot. Um, one of the things we're learning is, is we probably could have and should have been doing a lot better with virtual capability. Um, so because we had to go through some virtual solutions, we're finding out there's a lot of things that, that, that we could have been doing and should continue to do virtually. So we're building content PLI. And I'm not talking, to be clear, uh, I'm not talking about the, you know, log on to the cyber and the little emoji or whatever they call an avatar is talking you through some boring class. But the idea of a human being, and, you know, an instructor and humans interacting you know, using technology, Zoom, like, like we're doing here today, uh, there's a lot of stuff we can do that a lot. Um, break. I think there's a potential for us to overreact. You know, everybody's looking for money. Everybody's trying to save money. I'm nervous and I get a little defensive about people saying, well, you know, you did that virtually during COVID. So why do you need to have that course? Or why do you have that school? Um, I think what makes our PME great and the best in the world is, is the peer learning and relationship building that happens in schools. You know, if you guys think about it, you men and women, you, you know, you've probably fought on the battlefield with people that you were in a course with. I think that's powerful. You know, we're a human endeavor. It's a relationship-based, trust-based profession. Uh, so I don't want to overreact and say, we don't need to do this school anymore. I think the small group instruction, one over 16. Um, now, I think there's some future thing where instead of a 16 week course, you might sign out of your unit or start your TDY, but from your house, you got two weeks worth of stuff you can do virtually, you know, and then you bring, you come together, less time TDY, less money, less time away from your family. And we bring people together to leverage the peer learning collective aspect of that and then graduate everybody. So long answer, but but one, we're learning a lot. Two, we're capturing it. And three, oh, the other big myth is people think it's cheaper. It is absolutely more expensive to do virtual training. When you talk about what it takes to, you know, the, the network to include the requirement to protect it. So cyber defense network. It, 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 if anybody tells you it's cheaper to do virtual than bringing people TDY, uh, they are incorrect. So if you can help me dispel that, you know, if you get a chance. Over. Yeah, I suspect you know, there's a lot of infrastructure involved in doing that. And it's, yeah. So, um, hey, sir. Uh, so we have a question here regarding uh, discussions of potentially uh, moving uh, uh, part or 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 you know just basically our warrant officer PME to to Fort Leavenworth e either in part or 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 however much and um, so the question is what what can we do to ensure that we sustain our existing college and or our college and not have it uh, deactivated or rolled up into another institution uh, because we're so small. Yeah. No. Well, first of all, we're not doing. We're nobody's getting rid of the college. Number one. Okay. Um, there's a lot of power at Fort Leavenworth. Okay. So when you're talking, you know, warrant ILE level, senior warrant education, um, and this isn't going after the warrant cohorts. I'm I'm making the same argument across all of our all of our cohorts and all of our all of our compos. Um, there are things we can do at Fort Leavenworth that we can't do anywhere else in the uh, our faculty, we have good faculty everywhere, but we have world-class faculty here. Um, our library, uh, our guest speakers, we have every four-star general and their sergeant major, and there's no reason they couldn't bring their, their command chief warrant officers if I had it, if I had a collection of senior folks. So the guest speak, you know, this army senior leadership and then our guest speaker program, plus the relationship building we get when you interact with your peers, right? Uh, so I'm interested 
in, in you know, not, not in the next year or so, but I mean, it, it's, as we look longer term for how we want to do PME for our senior ones, I personally think there's some power in doing some of that at, at Leavenworth. Uh, won't do it unless it works for all three cohorts. You know, we, we have all three, all three, I'm sorry, all three compos. We have, or, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't do what we do for majors. Right. You can't you can't put 16 majors together and tell me that's a good cohort if there's not all three companies represented. Right? <laughs> so um, and I have, you know, I have a deputy commanding general from Compo 2 and a very talented colonel in Compo 3. And I, I, I never talked to General Daniels without telling her she should have senior rep out here. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think there's things we can do at, at, at Leavenworth that we can't do other places. Um, on on the mid range stuff, um, I, I think the two star generals and their command chief warrant officers that have them and they don't, they should. And I'm working on that. Uh, their sergeant majors, I think they are best postured and the most qualified team to do branch specific training. So so I'm, I think we should do more at Fort Sill for our fires warrants than we do at Rutgers, in my opinion. Uh, when it comes to branch technical and tactical competence. Um, now there's building warrant officers, you know, deciding who meets the standards to become a warrant. I think that's clearly the warrant officer college um, <clears throat> down at Fort Rucker. And, and there's some, how much of that should be under RMU, how much should that be under General Francis? You know, I, I'm not emotional about that because both the, you know, the guy who runs RMU and the guy who runs Rucker both work for me. So, I just want to get it right. I got no, I got no political bias or anything there. So I, I don't know if I answered your question. I probably generated more questions than answers on that one. But we're looking at everything. It's about, it's about moving people on that competence continuum. I was just talking about, you know, what does it mean to be knowledgeable? What does it mean to be proficient? What does it mean to be an expert? And how do we create mastery level in our senior ones? And I, I, you know, this may be controversial. I don't, I don't mean to offend anybody. I, I will tell you, um, we have warrants that are as good as they've ever been, and the best ones we ever had. And we have some candidate that may not be the technical, technical expertise of their branch and their their grade that we've had in the past in, in some branches. So that's the thing. I mean, I'm, I'm all for warrant officers being everything that we can possibly be, but no, you know, to me as a commission officer and commander, we have to have that technical and tactical competence in our warrants. That's why we have warrants. Um, everything else I'm fine with, I'm not against it. Um, but the bottom line is if you got a W3 who's the only W3 in the motor pool and he or she can't do what that warrant's supposed to be doing, there's nobody else. You can have a bad major. You can have a weak E7. You cannot have a warrant officer anywhere in the system that is not a technical and tactical master expert of their craft. And, and that's all I'm passionate about. So, you know, how do, how do, I, how do we guarantee that? You know, I mean, how, how do we say if you graduate from this, you know, if we're going to make you a W3 of this branch and this specialty, how, how are we sure about it? And that's really all I care about with PMD. Where we do it and what level goes where, I, I, I trust. Uh, really, I trust the great, you know, Command Chief Lawrence. That's that's who I listen to. You know, Joe McConville is mine. You know, the ones running around the COEs, the, the senior warrant. I sent my I sent my chief, my Command Chief Warrant Officer to the National Guard seminar to listen to their senior warrants, and I sent them to the Reserve one to listen to their senior. I'd go myself. They didn't invite me, but maybe the next time they'll invite me and I'll come. But I, I, I mean, I think the people who know those answers are somewhere in the senior ranks of our warrant officer cohort. Sir, I, I really appreciate that. And I probably sound like a broken record to everybody. Uh, but I think today we probably have the most cohesive, solid, uh, just wonderful senior warrant officer leadership team. Uh, within our cohort that we probably had in the Army in 100 years. I've said it dozens of times. I've written it. Um, and so I agree with you 100% on that, sir. And I think everybody does. Um, 
Let me uh, give you one more question, uh, and then we'll we'll let you off the hook, sir. Um, the question is, as the Army continues to address diversity and inclusion issues, uh, what are you doing to continue to promote uh, diversity uh, in the selection of instructors and other leadership positions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one, in indisputably, the best teams are diverse and inclusive teams, period. So to me, this isn't, you know, there's a morally correct aspect of it. I don't mean to make light about that, but, but this is about winning on the battlefield. You know, the more diverse and, and inclusive your team is, the more ideas you have, um, the more perspectives you have. Um, I, I personally think, you know, group think is one of the most dangerous things in the Army. You get a bunch of people with similar backgrounds and, and they all look alike and start getting like one answer instead of 12. So, so I believe it's absolutely essential and, and we're doing everything we can. Um, I, I will tell you just very candidly, Fort Leavenworth is not a diverse place. Um, it, 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 it's not. Um, I mean, I'm talking about the Army aspect of it, and that's not okay. I mean, I think it's absolutely essential that we have a representative faculty and cadre here. So the good news is um, the, the marketplace, the new, new management system <clears throat> is going to help me with the officer cohort. Um, and then I'm counting on my subordinate leaders as they recruit. And, you know, it's a privilege. You know, working in trade I is not like a B team guy, right? I mean, uh, I don't think I'm a B team guy. You know, uh, actually, I like all of you. I just always assumed everywhere I was was the most important place in the army. Or they wouldn't send me there, right? You know, so uh, trade act is important. It's an institutional army, for God's sake. You know, I mean, who do you want training people? Right? You want your best people. So we got a compelling narrative of why you should come here and work and we take good care of our people. I, I don't buy that come take a knee and trade out, but you're probably not going to get shot at unless you're doing something really wrong. And you're probably going to see your family on the weekends at least and most nights. Uh, so it's an opportunity for us to manage the force, get our best people in the teaching business. So I think we got a compelling narrative and I've charged all my leaders as they, as they get out and recruit and hire people. You know, it's, it's, it's not a one-year problem. I mean, it's going to take multiple assignment cycles, but it's something we value, something we recognize, and something we're working on. Well, sir, um, I we we thank you again, and I'm I'm just going to tell all the great folks that sent. Uh, uh, you know, we you got a lot of questions, and 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 we can't you know we can't take up all your day, so we can't do it. But a lot of these questions. I think uh, uh, j just for the benefit of the people who ask them, these are great questions for our wonderful Army Talent Management panel that we're doing later today on which uh, your CAC CCWO will participate. So I hope these folks will ask a lot of these other questions, a lot of great questions. And sir, we really appreciate you for taking the time that you have taken to be with us this morning. We, we, we can't thank you enough. Well, I, just real quick in closing one, I got more time. If you need, I'd ask you, if you don't mind, capture those questions that went unanswered and send them to me or Steve. And uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll either answer them back, maybe, you know, you publish it or put it out on your website or something. I don't, I don't want somebody who took the time to ask a question and not get an answer. So one, there, there's a tasker for you for inviting me to get some work. But uh, <laughs> the, I, I, I just like to close with a couple things. One, if you want, you know, you, you. I always tell people you can you can be part of the problem or part of the solution. You, you, I don't care when you decide, but you can't be. You got to pick. You can't you can't sit this one out. I'm talking to people that are wearing the uniform, and I hope are great soldiers for life. You care enough to be here. You care enough about the army to still be part of the solution. So so get involved. You know, if you're out in the force, you know, compete for and volunteer for coming to work and trade. I can get in the leader development business and the training business. Uh, if you're out in the operating force, we need feedback. Are we giving you what you want? What aren't we giving you that you need? You can send that direct to me. You can send it to Steve. Um, you know, uh, Chief Kilgore and I uh, go back to a little fight in a place called Fallujah and, and it saved my life and, and my men's life. And I trust him implicitly. He's, he's uh, in my opinion, a great representative of your cohort. And uh, if you, you all come together, give him feedback. If you convince him, you don't need to worry about convincing me. But I'll, I'll collaborate with all of you 
uh, individually. And again, four cohorts, three compos. That's my job. Everybody's got, we got, we're all in this together. And uh, I appreciate your all's time. I appreciate your service, especially for the, the Soldier for Life crowd out there. I'm closer to that than I am the, the <laughs> earlier younger folks uh, in my life. But God bless you for your service. Um, every every opportunity and everything we have, you know, the privilege of wearing this uniform is all on the backs. You know, it's all standing on the shoulders of the men and women who did it before us. So thank you all for staying involved. God bless you all. Thanks a lot. Well, sir, sir, thank you. And uh, just one last thing, uh, and we're going to make sure that uh, Mr. Kilgore uh, gets these to you, but we have a, a little gift. We'll make sure you get it, and it's a, a, a pair of Pilsner glasses. Special special message for you, like I told the CSA yesterday, special message for you on the bottom of the glass. You're not allowed to read it until you get to the bottom of the glass, sir. Well, I, I have that skill, so that'll, that'll, that's, that's something I have. I have that talent, so send it here. I'll, I'll do it on my porch, gladly. And if any of you all get through Leavenworth, get on the calendar. I'd love to talk to you some more. Thank you yes, very sir. much.